Oh, Crossing family, it is so good to be with you. We are in a sermon series on habits. I thought I would let you know some of my bad habits. Um, I drive fast when I'm going over bridges in case they collapse. Anybody else? Okay, a couple of you. I also will sometimes, if I really don't like the bridge, I'll crack the window so I can get it all the way down if I need to. Nobody else is a weird, okay, a couple weirdos. Um, I used to chew my fingernails. How many of you guys chew your fingernails? Okay, pick your burgers and eat them. Just joking, just wanted to catch a couple of you. Just wanted to catch a couple of you. Here's another one I have. Uh, before I go to bed, I like to shut all the doors. Do you guys like in the room, like if there's a closet door, you gotta shut all the doors. I organize my desk every day before I start work. I gotta have it, I think that's more just being a psycho. In junior high, this one was debilitating. I went to a three-story junior high and I was in a phase of my life where I had to end my steps on stairs on an even number. And so you're just going up the stairs and I'm counting in my head and like I gotta get to the, I almost went through a phase where I had to be divisible by four, but the Lord healed me. Um, here's, I'm, I'm not kidding. I made it all the way through Disney World when I was on the don't step on a crack or you'll break your mother's back. And there's a lot of concrete cracks in Disney World. Uh, I can, I have to eat more than one bowl of cereal. I don't know if I've ever eaten a bowl. And part of that's because I refuse to drink the milk until it's been properly diluted. And God bless whoever made Fruity Pebbles, because if that doesn't make milk delicious, I mean, unbelievable. Uh, I am a person who is trying hard to not take my phone to the bathroom with me. How many of you guys would be honest, you take your phone to the bathroom? Okay, here's why I stop. I'm trying to stop. I haven't been super successful. There's been so many times my legs, both legs have fallen asleep. And it feels like you're wiping somebody else's butt, which is weird. <laughs> and you like, you're trying to get out of the bathroom. Both legs are kind of hurt. You feel like you just wiped a stranger's butt. It's just not, it's not ideal. It's not how I want to live. But you can get sucked into the wrong thing on your phone. And next thing you know, 35 minutes and, you know, toilets fit me different than they fit you normal sized people. Anyhow, that's just some of the habits in my life I'm trying to navigate. And in this series, we've learned that between 40 and 95% of human behavior, which is how we think, what we say, and how we act, are habit based. Between 40 and 95%. And if our lives are based on the decisions we make, and our decisions are largely based on our habits, then there are some uncomfortable, unavoidable truths. First one, we are creatures of habit, which means that our habits form us. Which means if you change your habits, you can change your life. I want to welcome you joining from all of our different locations. Those of you who are watching online and inside. I also want to welcome those of you who are joining us for the first time or the first time in a long time. And to those of you who made a New Year's resolution to prioritize God, Jesus, or the church, I just want to cheer you on and tell you you're doing great. Keep it up. I think it's safe to say, and I've said this a bunch of times here, we all want a better life. We want better relationships. We want better health. We want a better walk with the Lord. We want a better faith. We want to make a bigger difference, make a larger impact. And our habits will either propel us forward or they will hinder us from making these dreams, goals, ambitions, uh, and resolutions a reality. And one habit, one sin, that is keeping you and I from living the life that we wanna have, experiencing the depth of relationships that we crave, and the impact that we desire is the habit, is the sin of complaining. I was talking to Jerry on my way here today, and I was uh, just, you know, kind of verbally vomiting. I said, well, I gotta get off the phone with you. I gotta go preach a sermon on complaining. And then we both started laughing. 
said, yeah, the opening five minutes of the sermon will just uh, be a shot of my rear end on camera while I'm already at the steps going, hey, guys, I can't preach this one yet. Author Will Bowen says this about complaining. Complaining is an epidemic that is destroying our happiness, our relationships, and our health, and our success. The problem is that most people are not even aware that they complain. Complaining, I love this illustration he gives, is like bad breath. You notice it when it comes out of somebody else's mouth, but not when it comes out of your own. I think every parent in whatever room you guys are at can relate to this. When we hear it in our kids, ah! When your kids, especially during snow days, uh, you know, Walmart was open. Figure out how to keep the schools open, okay? I'm not a teacher, all right? And your kids start going, I'm hungry. And you make them some food. Like, I don't want that food. I don't like that food. Well, then fix it yourself. We don't have anything in the pantry. And well, I don't have anything to do. I'm bored. Ugh. You know what we call it? Whining. Quit whining. But at some point in time, you get old enough that you're not a kid anymore. And so what do you call it when adults do it? Complaining. And the sad truth is, we regularly call it out in our kids. But we do it too. And who calls it out in you? When was the last time one of your friends overcame the hurdle of being passive aggressive and said, hey, do you realize that you complain a lot? We all do it. But when was the last time someone said, hey, do you know that you're like a complainer? The reason why I bring this up is because complaining impacts us relationally. It attracts the wrong kinds of people into your life. Do you know who likes complainers? Other complainers. And then you'll attract the worst kind of complainer, the one upper. Oh, so you think you had a bad day? And then they go on their story and then you don't want to listen to them. You start thinking of the worst thing that they're talking about so you can go, no, actually, I know you think, but what I really didn't even want to get into, but I will since you brought it up. And then they go down their road. And then you've just circled yourself with a cycle of negativity. And it brings you down. So it attracts the wrong kinds of people, which means it pushes the right kind of people away because the right kind of people don't want to get sucked in. They don't want to get dragged down. Listen to this. We haven't even got to the Bible. Scientists are discovering that frequent complaining, check this out, weakens your immune system, raises your cholesterol, makes you more susceptible to diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. I'm not fat. My wife's a complainer. <laughs> I've, she's not here, so I can get away with it. In 2016, Stanford did a study and found that complaining reduces the size of your hippocampus, which is responsible for memory and problem solving. Complaining or simply hearing complaining for more than 30 minutes a day can physically damage your brain. Ladies, if you wonder why your husband is fatter and dumber than when you first met him, it might be because the ladies he works with complain too much, okay? Okay? Oh, well, some of you are going to have a hard time writing an email this week. You're like, I don't know if I can complain about the sermon on complaining, because we complain about a lot of things, don't we? We complain about the prices at the pump and the grocery store. I spent 
I, I, well, I, I bought three dozen uh, M&M cookies from Hy-Vee last night because I'm on a diet. And uh, I wanted to cut back. And it was like, it was $6.99 or $5.99. I was like, this is ridiculous. We're going to have to give up, you know, bread. Uh, we complain about politics and we complain about culture. We complain about potholes. We complain about generational differences. We complain about situations at work. We complain about the weather, even though we all choose to live here. We could all leave. Like we've experienced how, this however many years you've been here. It's not a surprise. Come winter, check it out. It gets cold. Come summer, it gets hot. We've chosen to live in a miserable part of the country. This was us. We said we want car hearts or we want our shirts off. We want nothing in between. We complain about our health. We complain about our homes. We complain about our spouses. We complain about our friends. We complain about our family. We complain about our finances. We complain about the service at the restaurant, the speed of the drive through and the taste of the food. We can't stop complaining. In fact, we are so bad at complaining and we've gotten so used to complaining that's how we start off our conversations. How was your day today? Well, you wouldn't believe it. Boy, it's cold out there. Oh, it's so cold. I've been uncomfortable. My knee's been giving me fits. My wife won't get off my back. I got to get back surgery. I mean, you, we don't stop. But just so you know, complaining is part of the human experience. We find it all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. When Adam cries out to God and he says, this woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. And men have been grumbling about their wives ever since. There is no stopping the complain train that we are riding. There's perhaps no greater example of complaining than the Israelites who cried out to God when they were enslaved in Egypt. And God heard their cries to be delivered. And he sent Moses to deliver them. And Moses and Aaron performed 10 miraculous signs in front of them, the 10 plagues. And eventually Pharaoh released the people of Israel who'd been enslaved for generations and so they finally leave Egypt and they're approaching the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh changes his mind and says, no, we need all of these Israelites back to take care of us and to build our cities. And so he sends his army after the Israelites right after they had just received their freedom. And as the army of, Egypt, of the Egyptians approached, the Israelites cry out. Look what it says in Exodus 14. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, looked up, and there were Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and they cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. They're going, thanks a lot, God. I mean, I know we cried out to you and asked us to, you to deliver us, but then you went through the plagues and it got a little bit harder on us and then we kind of pseudo changed our mind, but then you delivered us and we were really stinking happy about that up until the army that you delivered us from came to attack us and there's no place for us to go. We're stuck between the army and we're stuck between the Red Sea. And you know what you're thinking? Didn't you just see God pers uh, perform 10 miraculous feats in front of you? But they weren't thinking about that. They were thinking about the army behind them. And they were complaining. And so God tells Moses to go out and spread his hand across the waters. And Moses does it. And the water divides to the right and to the left. And it divides in such a way that the ground that the Israelites walk on through the Red Sea was dry. And then after they get on the other side, they close the water up and their enemy is defeated. Well then, in chapter 15, the Israelites find themselves in the desert of Shur. They had not had water for three days, or they had not found water for three days, and they finally come to a place called Marah. 
and the water there is bitter and they can't drink it. And guess what they did? They went, our God is so good and so mighty and so powerful and he never takes his eye off of us. He'll come through. Nope, that's not even close to what they did. You know what they did? Well, I'll I'll let you read it. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? So then God had Moses throw a piece of wood into the water and he made it sweet. That was chapter, we've done chapter 14. We've done chapter 15. For those of you who kind of like are used to seeing things uh, and going, I think I know where this is going. Guess what happens in chapter 16? Well, in chapter 16, the Israelites start to get a little hungry. I can relate. I've been hungry before. I get a little hangry from time to time. They are 31 days into their freedom. 31 days. And in Exodus chapter 16, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. You know what God did? He sent manna and quail every single day and fed all of them. All they had to do is go out and gather it off the ground. In 31 days, the Israelites experienced three miracles. After experiencing 10 previous miraculous signs through the plagues. And every time they come into a hardship, adversity, their immediate response was not to believe that God would come through. Their immediate response was to complain about God and his deliverance. They go on again to grumble about the fact that there's no water at another place, and God brings water out of the rock and Rephidim. And I need you to know this, because this was a hard truth for me to take in. God takes your grumbling and my grumbling, your complaining and my complaining, personally, Look what it says. Now the people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. If you want to make God angry at you, like, I thought this was church. I thought the whole point was to get him to stop being angry. If you want to make God angry with you, keep complaining. God has called you and me, those of us who call ourselves Christians, he has called us to be different. They go out of their way in Scripture the teachers of of the Bible and the writers of the Bible, to show us that the Christian life is to be different, to be uncommon. Look what it says in 1 Peter 4, verse 9. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Fellas, when you find out your mother-in-law is coming over, you know what you're supposed to do? That sounds wonderful. What are we going to have? Or should we make scones? Like you're supposed to be in a place where you're going, I'm so glad that we get to help this, you know, frail person come into our house and give her love and warmth and all kinds of stuff. Husbands, you're not supposed to grumble. Wives, when your husband invites people over to the house, you shouldn't be going, oh, I can't believe it again. You should be going, oh, this is an opportunity for me to love people. Guys, you'll want to remember this verse. You don't see this one like hanging over kitchen tables at Hobby Lobby. Like, oh, the don't grumble sign. No, it's just eat, pray, love. Okay? (laughs) It's like, you you want to keep the grumbling. Okay? Put that one over your table and see who sits at it. Men, it's important for us that when we get opportunities to show hospitality. Women, it's important for us when we get opportunities to show hospitality. To see it as an opportunity to love people. Not to grumble about it. It's an opportunity for you and I to be a blessing to people. Look what it says in Philippians chapter 2. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Uh, Deal with kids that aren't grateful. A spouse who doesn't appreciate everything you do. A boss who's never satisfied. 
Wash a car that's got more rust than, than paint. Do everything. Shovel your drive when it's cold out. Mow your yard when it looks like trash. Push mow it when the riding mower's broke. Do everything without, I mean, it says everything. I could go places, I won't. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. So that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Confrontational moment in the sermon. Ready? If it hasn't been there already, you're like, you're there. Do you handle hardships in life in such a way that people go, there's something different about you? Everybody has a bad boss. Do you handle it differently? Everybody has hardships in their marriage. Do you handle it differently? Everybody has kids that are ungrateful and whine. Do you handle it differently? Everybody has moments of their life that don't go as planned. Do we handle it differently or do we perform the same way those in a warped and crooked generation handle it? By whining and complaining and grumbling. He's saying you will shine among them like stars. That you will walk in the same aisles at the grocery store. And while everybody else is complaining about the prices. And that you can't find stuff. And your wife didn't want to get out in the cold. And so you're trying to figure out exactly what she wants. And she thinks that she knows where everything is in in the store. But they rearrange stuff. I'm just saying I've been there. And do you go, this is an opportunity for me to just shine like a star. This just, you know, (laughs) oh, oh, I mean, just, you know, look at all the options for spaghetti. Oh, this will be perfect. I'm going to get five and they'll all be wrong which will give me an opportunity to come back out and meet somebody else. (laughs) Or do you go, (laughs) how you and I handle the inconveniences of life, the flat tires and the long lines and the relational challenges is supposed to set us apart so that people see us and they go, I want what you have. But they'll never see that if we're saying the same things that they're saying. Complaining gets in the way of our ability to minister to others and point them to Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 says this. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. If somebody were to listen to you, would they be edified and built up? I heard a motivational speaker once, and he said there's two kinds of people in the world. There's uh, basement people and there's balcony people. Balcony people call people up to the balcony, and basement people pull people down into the basement. You have a choice to make. Do you want to be a person who brings people to the balcony or drags them to the basement? Do the words that you use, are they building the people up around you? Or are they leaving more frustrated and more depressed at our culture, at our politics, at life because they interacted with you? You might be going, okay, you sold us. We got to stop complaining. But Clayton, I'm going to need some help. Okay, so how do we do this? Luke chapter 6. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Every single one of you, you are full of it. The question is, what's the it? Are you full of a grumbling, complaining spirit? Or are you full of thankfulness and gratitude and peace? 
Whatever is coming out of your mouth is an indicator of what is occupying your heart. So pay attention to what's coming out of here because it will tell you what is in here. And if you change what's in here, it will change what comes out of here. Here's another way you can deal with it. When hardships come, when frustrations come, when things don't go the way you'd like them to go, don't keep it, cast it. First Peter chapter five, verse seven says, cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So this is what it would look like. God, it is frustrating having the prices go up in a way that I wasn't planning on. This is affecting my budget. But God, help me use this as an opportunity to trust you more and still give me opportunities to be generous. It's different than going, can you believe the price of Fruity Pebbles? Right? Oh, you're going to have a thousand opportunities in the upcoming week. And you can choose to complain about it to others and drag them down. Or you can use it as an opportunity. So you know what? I'm just going to cast this frustration, this fear, this deep-rooted part of me. I'm going to cast it to God because I know that he cares for me. The other thing you can do is you can change what you do. You can start changing your behavior. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians. These are, if you're wanting to memorize a verse and you're like, I need to get into Bible memory, just memorize verse 16 or verse 17. It's just two words. You're like, I memorized two verses today, babe. Rejoice always. Pray continually. I couldn't get to 18. It was too long, right? This is what he says. Rejoice always. Wins always. All the time. Pray continually. How often is that? All the time. Give thanks in how many of the circumstances? I don't like the Bible either. Some of you are like, I never knew. I never liked that book. Sounds horrible. In all circumstances? Why? For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. How many of you have ever asked the question, what's God's will for my life? The rest of you, uh, if you didn't raise your hand, uh, why are you here? Like, what does God want me to do with my life? I'll tell you. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is going to make you weirder than a $2 bill. You are going to be a nut job walking around town. Because everybody else is going to be complaining. And you're going to be going, I love all the varieties of spaghetti sauce. And I love how expensive they are. Jesus, don't you see how cool... You're going to look like a complete weirdo. And it's going to make people go, I want what you have. I want to be able to go through the hardships and the grievances and the pain of life and it not impact my mood and not impact my relationships. And I'm able to pull people up instead of push people down. What he's saying is, as you go about your life, Rejoice instead of grumble. Pray instead of complain. Give thanks instead of being negative. Why is he telling you all this? It's because the hardships of life and our ability to endure them in a godly way matures us in Christ. It strengthens our faith. Look what it says in James chapter 1. This is another brutal verse. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You have a choice when life does not go your way. You can complain or you can grow. When life doesn't go your way, you can whine or you can become complete. You can grumble or you can become mature. Perhaps the most abused verse in scripture has some insight into this. For those of you who already have the tattoo, let me set it up the way Paul does. Philippians chapter four. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. He's saying, whether I'm having a good day or a bad day, I'll be okay. 
Whether I have everything I need or I need everything, I'll be fine. I'll be content. Do you know what, how he's going to do this? Anybody know what the next verse is? You ready? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What? I thought that verse was about whether or not the Chiefs were going to win in the playoffs. I thought this was about me nailing my dance routine. I thought that verse was about me getting a promotion. I thought that verse was about me getting a pretty girl to finally marry me. I thought that verse was about me losing weight. I thought it was about me winning a bit at work. Nope. It was not about you getting those pants to fit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Some of you people have been there. (laughs) I'm calling on Jesus. Right? It's not about any of that. The I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is about I can get through anything. Whether things are going my way or everything's against me. I can be content when it's hot outside in summer and it's unbearably cold in a Midwest winter. I can get through it because he gives me strength. This is about you having a bulletproof life with Christ. That you can throw whatever you want to at me and I can be content because Christ is my strength and my portion. Philippians, that's where it comes out of. That church was started and Paul and Silas got put in prison and you know what they were doing after they'd been beaten and put in prison? They were singing songs like weirdos. And then an earthquake happens and all the jail cells break open and all the prisoners that were next to them didn't leave. They're like, I wonder what the next song's gonna be. And a church was started because people were being thankful in the midst of a bad situation. So Paul writes to this church, Philippians. And guess where Paul is sitting when he writes the letter to the church in Philippians? In jail! Paul's going, you can do whatever you want to with me. I'm going to accomplish what the Lord has for me. I can't be slowed down. I can't be detoured. We see, when we look at the Israelites, we look at them and we go, how could you be complaining when God is doing so much around you? We see in them, how after the 10 plagues, could you doubt that God wouldn't handle you at the Red Sea? After everything that God did at the Red Sea, how could you complain when you didn't get the water you wanted? How could you, after you got the water you wanted, how could you doubt that God wouldn't get you through a little bit of hunger? And after the manna and the quail, how could you think that there wouldn't be water again? We look at them and go, how could you? But complaining is like bad breath. It's easier to notice it in others than to notice it in you. We look at the Israelites and we wonder how could you complain when God is doing so much on your behalf, but you and I, we do the same thing. We see their error, but we struggle to see our own. How could you and I possibly complain when we have so much going for us? Because the God of the universe loved us when we were unlovely. Jesus came and died for us when we didn't deserve it forgives us when we ask for it, adopts us when we're unworthy, hears us when we pray, is preparing a place for us in heaven, defends us from Satan, intercedes for us before the Father. Paul cries out in Romans, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. That when we walk into the darkest of valleys, we may walk into it, but we don't walk into it alone. No matter what we face, we don't have to face it alone. We have way too much going for us to spend any time complaining. And I hope you'll join me in it. We're moving to a time of decision. (laughs) To those of you who um, haven't started an intimate personal relationship with Jesus, you just need to know this. Your life is going to have hardships and your life is going to have struggles regardless of whether or not you begin your relationship with Jesus. 
I don't want to like, you know, sell you the car and then you drive home and the wheels fall off. I want to be up front with you. You're going to have hardship whether you have Jesus or you don't. The difference is, is that when you have the hardship, you won't be alone. Everybody gets a flat tire, but it's different when your dad's in the car, isn't it, girls? Everyone has car trouble. It hits different when your dad's a mechanic. Everybody gets in a wreck. It's a little bit different when your dad runs a body shop. Everyone gets cavities. It's different when your dad's a dentist. When you start your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to have to go through the hardships of life. But the promise of the gospel is that you will have the author of life with you. And he can redeem any situation. He can save any sinner. You are going to leave here and you are going to have life hit you in the mouth. I just need you to know that when it takes its swing at you, he'll be standing there with you. Some of the punches he's going to block, I can't even, I have no clue all the things that he saved me from. And some of the punches I'm going to take, and he's going to clean me up. You can go through life on your own, or you can do life with him. And I'll just tell you, I've done both. And I'm never going back. And that's not just my testimony. That's the testimony of thousands of people who call the crossing home. If you're here today and you've never started a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would appeal to you. You don't have to do life alone. You don't have to get it all figured out before you start a relationship with your Heavenly Father. He knows everything you've done. He's pre-decided to love you. He's pre-decided to forgive you. He's just waiting on you to be ready to receive it and live a life in response to it. And so in just a few moments, the people around you, some of them are going to come up to the steps and pray. Some of them are going to get down on their knees where they're at. Some of them are going to lift their hands in worship. But I want to encourage you to walk right over there by that baptistry and to talk to somebody about how to start a relationship with Jesus Christ. To those of you who already have a relationship with Jesus, this is the part of the message that twisted me up. Our complaining is hurting our ability to reach the very people that Jesus came to save. Our complaining makes us indistinguishable. The people around us miss out on the hope that we have in him. And so the Bible's antidote to our complaining is to give thanks. To spend time thanking God for all that he's done for us and continues to do for us. To spend time repenting, saying, God, I've been ungrateful. I haven't been thankful. And when we do that, God will replatform your life so that way you can be a light to those in darkness. And if you're like me, and you have a burden for your friends and your family members and your neighbors and the people in your community to find Jesus, and you realize that your complaining is getting in the way of your prayers being answered, you're gonna wanna beg God to forgive you and to change you. Would you stand with me? God, I keep driving to this place so hopeful and so optimistic that at any moment in time, this church could catch fire and people's lives would be radically changed and transformed. God, I look forward to the day when this place is packed, services are added because the people we care about are starting to care about you. And God, on behalf of this church, we owe you an apology. You've been so good to us. And we just slip into the trap of complaining like ungrateful children. God, on our 
worst days, you haven't abandoned us. You haven't stopped loving us. You haven't shut off the spigot to guide us. But God, we want you to do a mighty and radical work in our hearts. Change what's on the inside so we can help change people on the outside. In your name I pray, amen.